All right, we're talking about Mark's Gospel, and we're going to do a brief overview of Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, very simple to outline, really in two, two parts, two key parts. Mark's central theme is really Christology, who Jesus Christ is, and his two parts, the two parts of Mark's Gospel, focus on two aspects of that Christology. The, the first half of the, the Gospel is really focused on Jesus as the mighty Messiah, and Son of God, focusing on the mighty deeds of the Son of God. You get to a key central midpoint, and we'll look at that passage. It's Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. And then there's an enormous shift as we learn that the mighty Messiah is going to suffer and die. He's going to go to the cross to suffer and die. So the second half of Mark's Gospel, chapter 831, uh, through the resurrection narrative, is the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. So we just want to look at two key aspects of each of those, or a key aspect of each of those halves, focusing on Mark's Christology. Uh, the key word for the first half of Mark's Gospel is authority. That term occurs again and again, and even when it doesn't occur, we see that it's all about Jesus' authority. Mark is demonstrating that Jesus is indeed the mighty Messiah and the Son of God. So let's look at various aspects of that authority. Uh, first of all, Jesus' authoritative message. Jesus comes on the scene, and the first thing he does is be, he begins proclaiming the kingdom of God. Here's our passage, Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of, of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus announces the arrival of the kingdom of God. Now, that's a shocking statement. Um, we talk about advancing the kingdom of God, and we might say, we're going to go down and have a beach barbecue and advance the kingdom of God. It's not the way it would have sounded in the first century. It would have been more like someone holding up a sign saying, the end of the world is here. Uh, Jesus was announcing that God was stepping in to reestablish his kingdom, to reestablish the conditions of paradise, essentially, and that he was the inaugurator of that. That's extraordinary authority. Authority in announcing, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Second key evidence of Jesus' authority is in calling and appointing disciples. Uh, Jesus begins walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees two, two brothers who are fishermen and he calls them. They immediately leave everything and follow him. He goes a bit further and sees James and John, two other brothers. He calls them, immediately they drop everything and follow him. The key point we're supposed to get is Jesus' sense of authority. He merely speaks and they respond. They drop everything and follow him. A little bit later in chapter 3, he appoints 12 disciples. And that's a statement of a astonishing authority as well because those 12 clearly represent the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the restoration of the 12 tribes of Israel. Who called Israel into existence in the first place? It was God himself. So Jesus is functioning like Yahweh, like the Lord God, in calling the renewed or restored Israel into existence. That's extraordinary authority, demonstrating that he is, in fact, the Messiah. Third, authority in teaching, authority in teaching. Jesus comes to Capernaum. He establishes Capernaum as his home base, and he goes into the synagogue and begins to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them, there it is, there's our word, as one who had authority, Mark 1, 21 and 22, not as the teachers of the law. The teachers of the law would just repeat the traditions before them. Jesus spoke with fresh authority. He spoke the very word of God, claiming the authority of God, authority in teaching. It's interesting because Mark gives less of Jesus' teaching than the other gospels, but he refers to Jesus as a teacher more than the other Gospels. His point is that Jesus speaks with authority. He speaks with the voice of God. That's third, authority in teaching. Fourth, authority in exorcism, casting out demons, authority over the demonic realm. That same passage where Jesus is teaching with authority continues. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. Now it's interesting because there's clearly just one demon present. It says the man is possessed by an evil spirit. But that evil spirit says, have you come to destroy us? And the point is that the whole demonic realm recognizes who Jesus is and, and quakes in fear at his coming. With a word then, he casts out the demon. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly, come out of him. 
the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. So the demons obey Jesus because of his extraordinary sense of authority, demonstrating he's the Messiah. And then the response of the people. We see this over and over again in Mark's gospel, this sense of amazement. Mark uses like six or seven different Greek words for amazement. Amazement, astonishment. They were shocked. They marveled at him over and over again. They're, they're amazed. New teaching. He casts out demons with a word and they obey him. Notice he puts the teaching first. The casting out of demons is just to confirm that Jesus is announcing and proclaiming the kingdom of God. It's authority over demons. Um, fifth is authority to forgive sins. We know this story. The, Jesus is teaching in a crowded house. Nobody can get in the doors. So some four men come carrying a paralyzed friend. And they open up the roof. They tear up the roof and drop the man down. What is everyone expecting? They're all expecting Jesus to forgive the, or to heal the man. But instead, what does Jesus say? He says, your sins are forgiven. Uh, the religious leaders are shocked and they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? And to prove that he has the authority to forgive sins, Jesus heals the man. So Jesus demonstrates God's own authority to forgive sins. Next, authority over the law. It was the Lord God who instituted the Old Testament law. Now Jesus demonstrates he has authority over it. There are two Sabbath controversies here in Mark's gospel. Jesus is going through the grain fields. His disciples are walking along, picking off heads of grain. And the religious leaders challenge them. They say, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, it might look like the disciples are stealing on the Sabbath, but you were allowed, if you were in a neighbor's grain field, to pick off grain and eat it. What they're doing, according to the religious leaders, is they're working on the Sabbath. And that's breaking the Old Testament law. Jesus responds by telling the story of David in the Old Testament, how David ate the bread of the presence, the tabernacle bread that only the priests were allowed to eat. Now that was allowed because of human need. So he concludes, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. God didn't establish the Sabbath to control people. He, he established the Sabbath to bless them. So that's, that's a statement of the true meaning of the Sabbath. But then Jesus says something astonishing. He says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. An astonishing statement of authority. Jesus says, I, as the Son of Man, as the Messiah, have authority over the Sabbath. Well, who established the Sabbath? God himself established the Sabbath. Yet Jesus places himself above the law, able to, to interpret the law, but also able to transform and fulfill the law. Um, authority over nature. Uh, the calming of the storm. Jesus and the disciples go out on a boat. Uh, Jesus says, let's cross to the other side. Mark chapter 4, a storm comes up on the Sea of Galilee. Waves are breaking over the boat. It's nearly swamped. Jesus is sleeping on a cushion in the boat. The disciples are panicking. Jesus is sleeping. I often ask my students, why, are, why is Jesus sleeping? Um, well, because he's human. He's tired. So we see his true humanity as well as his deity here. Um, teacher, the disciples say, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down immediately, and it became completely calm. Shocking statement, this, this raging storm, and Jesus just commands the storm to stop, and it stops. Incredible authority. The disciples are shocked. They're saying, I don't think this guy's from around here. Um, he says, who, they say, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Even the wind and the waves obey him. A shocking um, demonstration of authority to even control the weather. Now that's a, a divine claim, really, because only God controls the weather. Here's Psalm 65, 5 through 7. It says, you answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring seas, the roaring of the waves. Who is capable of calming a storm, of turning a storm on and off? God alone is. Psalm 89.9, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Again, when Jesus calms the, the storm, it's a demonstration of divine authority. So we get all these acts of authority, one after the other, demonstrating that G Jesus is the mighty Messiah who is inaugurating the kingdom of God. We reach an initial climax then, a, a central point, when we get to Peter's confession in Mark chapter 8. 
Jesus takes his disciples on a spiritual retreat north, north of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asks them a question. He says, who do people say that I am? And they say, some say John the Baptist, others one of the prophets. He then turns to them and say, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, responds for the rest. He says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. How does Peter know that? Well, Peter has been seeing these powerful signs, that the authority of the Messiah. So we're going to see the first half of Mark's gospel focused on the authority of the Messiah, the second half on the suffering way of the Messiah. Jesus turns to Peter at this point. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah there. So this is the key turning point as Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. Based on everything he's seen, based on all the acts of authority that he's demonstrated, he's the Messiah. Um, but then Jesus makes a, a shocking claim. Um, from his identity as the Messiah, he talks about the role of the Messiah. The, the Messiah is not here to conquer the Romans. The Messiah is here to suffer and die. At this point, Jesus gives what we call his first passion prediction. He predicts his coming suffering and death. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Jesus says that the Messiah is going to suffer and die. And Peter thinks Jesus can't have this defeatist attitude. He's going to win. He's going to conquer the Romans. So he rebukes him. But Jesus rebukes Peter right back. But Jesus, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus says, Peter, you're not thinking God's thoughts. God is going to defeat a greater foe than the Roman Empire. He's going to defeat Satan, sin, and death through my death on the cross. So from this point on then, the focus turns from Jesus as the mighty Messiah and powerful Son of God to his suffering role as the suffering Messiah. Picking up the theme from Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering role of the Messiah described in Isaiah 53. Here's Isaiah 53, five and six. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In verse 11, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. That verse 11 is particularly important because Jesus is going to allude to that, that verse in um, Mark 10, 45, when he's going to say the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So here's our outline once again. The first half of the gospel, Jesus as the mighty Messiah and powerful Son of God. The second half of the gospel, then the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. And that develops through three cycles of events. And I want to just briefly show you those three cycles of events. They're in chapter 8, starting with Peter's confession, chapter 9, and chapter 10. In each case, the pattern is the same. Jesus predicts his death. You've got three passion predictions. Then the disciples display some act of pride or ignorance. Uh, then Jesus teaches on humility and servant leadership. So here's the pattern once again. Three times Jesus predicts his death. Each time the disciples respond with pride, misunderstanding. Jesus then gathers them together and teaches them about cross-bearing discipleship. The first one is the one we just looked at, the first passion prediction. When Jesus predicts, after Peter confesses you're the Messiah, Jesus predicts he's going to suffer and die. Peter misunder misunderstands. He rebukes him for that. Jesus rebukes him right back. And then in the verses that follow, he teaches about what it means to be a disciple. If you want to follow me, he says, you have to take up your cross and follow me. You have to be willing to bear your cross, which means to suffer and die for me. That's the first passion prediction, chapter 8, verse 31. The second one's easy to find. It's in chapter 9, verse 31. Jesus again predicts his death. Again, the disciples display pride and misunderstanding. While Jesus is predicting his death, they're back there debating over who is the greatest. Who is the greatest? So Jesus once again gathers them together and teaches them about servant leadership, saying that the first will be last and the last 
will be first. The third passion prediction then comes in chapter 10. So you've got one in chapter 8, one in chapter 9, one in chapter 10. They're easy to find. Jesus again, a third time, predicts his coming death. The Messiah is going to suffer and die, he says. Um, the, again, the disciples demonstrate pride and, and, and selfishness. James and John come to Jesus and they ask for the chief seats in the kingdom, to sit at his right and his left in his kingdom. Um, a third time then they demonstrate pride and ignorance. A third time then Jesus gathers the disciples together and teaches them about servant leadership. He says, this is the way the world leads. The world leads by power, by oppression, by control, but not so with you. If anyone wants to be first, they've got to be last. If you want to be great, you've got to be a servant. If you want to lead, you've got to be slave of all. And then he comes to what is really the theme verse of Mark's gospel. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, and to give, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even the mighty Son of God, even the mighty Messiah came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the whole of Mark's gospel, presenting Jesus as the mighty Messiah and Son of God, he truly is the Messiah, but the Messiah's role is to suffer and die so that we might, we might have life. And now he calls us as disciples to follow that suffering way. If we want to lead, we have, to be a true servant leader means to be willing to sacrifice yourself for others, to call them to be all that God has called them to be. So two parts of Mark's Christology, the, suffer, the mighty Messiah and Son of God, followed by the suffering servant of the Lord. Both of those point to our role as, as disciples, those who are willing to follow, willing to take up our cross and follow him. Mm -hmm.